Fred Kemp, welcome back to CNBC. It's great to see you. Good to see you. You've said this is the most important geopolitical year of our lifetimes. Why? Uh, uh, war in the Middle East, war in Europe, tensions with China and the U.S. and Asia. You have uh, a technological disruption of artificial intelligence where there's a, a race for the commanding heights of technology. And it all com comes together in one year. And oh, by the way, the most important American election maybe of our lifetimes. And half of the globe is voting this year. So eight of the most populous, populous democracies and, and 70 uh, electoral votes all over the, all, all over the world uh, at a time of great volatility. So a time like this, uh, President Eisenhower talked about uh, never letting a crisis go to waste. Uh, well, we, now we have lots of crises. And if you manage them in the right way, you can turn the Middle East crisis into a longer term peace. You can turn Ukraine's difficulties into a sovereign, democratic, secure Ukraine. And you could get the relationship with China on even footing, but it's going to take a, a real balancing act and some great leadership at a time when that doesn't seem to be in high demand. Great leadership. Do we have that in the United States? Uh, you certainly have a di diagnosis of the situation. So let's start with the Middle East. I think the Biden administration sees that you could turn the current situation into a 100-year solution for the Middle East. But to do that, you'd have to have Hamas lose, number one. The Palestinians would have to win, number two. That means a path to a two-state solution. Israel would have to be secure. And you'd have to build on the Abraham Accord states to get to a regional security solution. If all those pieces could put, be put together, uh, you could really turn this terrible crisis into a great outcome the problem is that vision. Um, and the vision isn't so much lacking in the United States right now in the view of the Biden administration, but uh, Netanyahu's focus on eradicating Hamas, which is understandable um, and is causing a lot of tension right now between the United States and Israel. Uh, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Americans don't think that actually solves Israel's problems in the region longer term. The only thing that would solve Israel's problems longer term is a regional security structure where it really makes peace, comes to normalization uh, with the countries of the Middle East, the Abraham Accord states, and of course, most critically right now, Saudi Arabia. Characterize the relationship between the United States and Israel right now. The US position has been unequivocal support for Israel, but at the same time, it would appear, at least according to recent reporting, that a rift is now emerging between President Biden and leader Netanyahu. So what is the next flashpoint we should be watching? And is this relationship headed on a crash course? So um, it, it, it's a relationship that has strains that are growing with the electoral season. Uh, uh, it, the US election, uh, uh, former President Trump and President Biden could swing on two or three states. Take one of those states, Michigan. Uh, Biden won by uh, fewer votes in the last election than there are Arab American votes that could go against them because of what's going on in the Middle East. So it's an international situation for Biden. It's also a, a deeply domestic political situation. On the other hand, President Biden goes to Israel right after October 7th. He becomes one of the greatest heroes in Israeli history among American presidents. The, the Israeli people are no great fans of President Netanyahu. Uh, so I think it's a really dramatic uh, time right now where the domestic politics for Netanyahu are coming up into collision with the domestic politics of President Biden. Just before I let you go, what did you make of Tucker's interview with President Putin? It seems as if he didn't push back on a number of claims that Putin made, but at the same time, he's also being lauded here for at least having access to what has been regarded as an elusive leader who we need answers from. Well, I think what we need is access to the elusive leader and then asking him questions uh, that he still isn't answering, which is, uh, uh, you know, his vision of history is false. It's fake. Uh, uh, Carlson didn't, uh, didn't contest that. Um, you know, he has rubbed out a European border. The Ukrainians certainly think they're a state and they're a country and that they have to continue to survive. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's... Um, there's a whiff of appeasement in the air, and I think Tucker Carlson took that all the way to Moscow with him. It seems to have taken him all the way to the UAE as well. What do you make of that? Uh, I think it's very interesting uh, to have these voices there. I, 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 what I really uh, 
think is you have to have a debate, you have to have a sharp debate, and the tough questions have to be asked. Uh, the, uh, we are, we're watching one of the worst international crimes of our lifetime unfolding uh, in, in Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and I think, and this is where I speak about 2024, of all the things we're talking about, the Middle East, China, Ukraine, Ukraine is the most urgent and decisive issue this year that could shape the geopolitics for a generation. If uh, uh, a country like Russia and a leader like Putin is allowed to get away with what he's gotten away with, uh, then we're not going to be facing an international, here we're at the World Government Summit, an international situation that's ruled by rule of law, but rather by the rule of the jungle.